All right, so last video, we reintroduced the idea of a two-way table going back to chapter one. And remember that when we use two-way tables, what we're usually doing is we're comparing two different categorical variables to each other. So that's what we're kind of working towards here, is how you define or analyze the relationship between two variables that are both categorical. And we learned in the last video that actually that sort of scenario is when you would use a chi-square test statistic. And there are actually two versions of the chi-square test that you can do on a two-variable problem. You have what's called the chi-square test for homogeneity, which we introduced last video. We're going to spend a little more time on here. And you also have the very similar chi-square test for independence, which we'll cover in the next video for 11.2c. It's important for you guys to realize, though, in both of these situations, the chi-square tests, both for homogeneity in the next one, you're going to end up using these when you have two categorical variables. So the idea with the chi-square test is we want to know how these two categorical variables do or don't relate to each other. So our first friend in terms of chi-square tests for two variables is called the chi-square test for homogeneity. We talked about these hypotheses last video. The essential idea with HO is that you have no difference in the distribution of whatever variable you're studying as your explanatory. So our example last video was talking about, basically, we had that different music playing at the restaurants. We had French music, we had Italian music, we had no music. And we wanted to see if how people ordered, the breakdown of their orders was different depending on which explanatory value was understudied. So it's not always in an experiment, but I like to think about this a lot. It's used frequently in experiments. So next video, you're going to have to keep this straight with what's called the chi-square test for independence. Homogeneity typically or frequently occurs in situations where you're doing an experiment. I've got my French music crew. I've got my Italian music crew. Are they different, the different bubbles, in how they handle um, the response variable of entrees? So you have your hypotheses up here established. And then the uh, conditions that we use for a chi-square test for homogeneity are actually no different than the conditions you would do in a chi-square goodness of fit, one variable problem. Um, so just same sort of conditions you guys have known to expect. So in a chi-square two variable problem, with one variable problems, what we do is we end up just going to the stat edit. I'll just pull up my calculator here. I'm going to need it in a bit anyway. But what we end up doing for goodness of fit is we throw it in the stat edit menu. The issue with that is our calculator doesn't like it that for two way tables. Stat edit is good when you have just one variable, as in goodness of fit, like our MM color, and that was it. But what you're going to need to do on two variable problems is actually go to the matrix menu on your calculator. Now, depending on if you guys um, saw this in Algebra 2 or if you've taken pre-calc, you may not have ever used this menu before. But the matrix menu is right here in blue where my mouse cursor is. So I'm going to go second and I'm going to go matrix right here. And you can throw your two-way table into one of these matrices on your calculator. In order to do that, you'll go over to the edit tab and then you can type into these. I'll do this with an example shortly. So um, I don't really even know if there's stuff I need to write down right here for you guys. You got to hit second, then you go matrix, then you go edit. And that'll make more sense when we actually do our examples here. So we've got our big problem for the day here. And let's kind of read through this and see what our context is. So we're trying to test, it appears, um, that we're looking at what color survey people actually get. So we've got a red version of the survey that's being given to 20 people. We've got a blue version of the survey, and we've got a control presumably on white paper survey. And then they people were asked, let me see what they were asked. I should have read this ahead of time. 
So when you think about red versus blue, they wanted to see what people were thinking about and stuff like that, reminding people about the color. At the end of the day, they had people choose colored candy. So you either got to choose a red candy or a blue candy afterwards. And they were curious if the color of the paper that you received your survey on um, had any sort of bearing on what kind of candy people actually chose afterwards. So here's our actual data. Um, and it, presumably it was the same candy, just with red or blue wrappers on it. So there's our data. And then they basically say, hey, go for it here. Just do statistics and tell us if there's convincing evidence that the color of the paper maybe made some sort of impact or had a difference on what sort of candy people ended up choosing. So let me go through my thought process here as I read this problem. I notice I've got a two-way table. Two-way tables right there by themselves should scream chi-squared to you guys. But let's make sure these are actually categorical variables. We've got the color of our survey, and we've also got the color of our candy. Those are definitely two categorical variables. And what we're looking for is if the different surveys have different rates of people choosing whatever candy they choose. So we want to know if the distribution of choice for red survey versus blue survey versus control survey is any different. This is totally a situation where we'd want to do a chi-square test for homogeneity. So our HO and HA, we're going to establish hypotheses first thing here. Remember, HO is saying there's no difference, statement of no difference. No difference in what? Well, no difference in what candy people choose depending on what survey they get. HA will then be that there is a difference. And then you'll set a significance level as well. I'm going to pause and come back with that. All right, so I'm back with my hypotheses written out here, or at least HO. Um, remember, statement of no difference for HO, there's no difference between the different surveys in terms of what candy people choose. Good word to have right here, really essential word. Make sure the word distribution makes it into your hypotheses here. There's no difference in the distribution of your response, which is the candy choice between your different surveys. Also be careful, I caught myself almost while I was writing this, I almost said received instead of receive, but you need that present tense so it acts like you're talking about like everything. If you do past tense, it sounds like you were only talking, talking about the sample you already got. So present tense is big, and then we have to throw down our significance level as well. The next thing we're gonna do is actually check our conditions. And in order to check said conditions, you do need to know your expected counts. So before I can go and check my conditions, I've got my observed table right here with what I actually got in my random assignment, my little experiment, but I need to know my expected counts as well. So I will remind you guys how you find those, and then I'm gonna show you a sweet shortcut from your calculator. So I'm going to set this up the same way here. So I'm just going to have a little two by three table. When you make your expected counts, you need to make sure you show work for at least one of them. And if I didn't have my other table like right there, I would probably want to label everything. And it still doesn't hurt. Red survey, blue survey, control survey, red candy, and blue candy. I explained this last video. But let's talk about how you would actually calculate these expected counts. 26 people chose red candy altogether out of 60. So I would take 26 out of 60. That's the percentage of people who like red candy. And we would assume that that's evenly distributed amongst all three groups. Well, I had 20 people in this first group right here. So I would multiply this to get my expected for the top left box right here. Um, but that ends up just being, like if it's confusing to think about it that way, remember it's row total times column total divided by grand total. And if I bust out my calculator right here to at least get that one entry, 26 times 20 and then divided by 60 is gonna get me an expected count for that box of 8.6 repeating. Show your work for one or two of the terms um, and you'll be in good shape there. So you could carry on with doing that and that would be lovely. Um, later on, I am gonna show you guys how to do this. I'll just do it now on the calculator.
So mm, let me think about how I want to do this here. I think I'm going to go ahead and show you guys, I'm skipping some stuff right now, which is bad practice. But when we actually calculate our chi-square test statistic later, after we actually go ahead and verify our conditions, I want to do one term by hand. So the way that that would work, if I'm going for top left right here, I would take my observed for that top left minus my expected. I would square it and I would divide by my expected. And then I would add on my next pair. So it's going to be this five right here. And then I'm going to do this guy and I get each of my six little components. I'm kind of skipping all over the place here. Let me pull out my calculator, though, um, because I want to show you guys how to get the expected counts off of your calculator, which is easier than needing to do them by hand like I've started to do here. So eventually, my game plan is going to be to go to the matrix menu right here. Once in the matrix menu, I'm going to hit edit. And on edit, I'm just going to throw it in matrix A. So. Matrix A is a two by three matrix, two rows, three columns. If you like can't remember three by two, two by three, just try something and see if it looks like the table. So it does. We're good there. And I'm going to type in my observed counts. Again, it feels like I'm doing this out of order because I haven't checked my conditions yet, but the calculator will actually calculate the expecteds for me here. So I got my stuff typed in and I'm going to quit out. You actually do not need to type the expected in yourself. The calculator will do that for us. If we go ahead and run a chi-square test. So goodness of fit, GOF, is for one variable. If you have a two-way table, you want just the standard chi-square test, which is choice C right here. It's going to ask you, where are my observed counts? They're in matrix A right now. The expected, it is going to... Like it says, where are they? It's actually going to put them in B for us. So I'm going to leave that alone. And I'm just going to run my tests. And I will come back for my p-value and stuff later. I'm going to get back to that. But after you run your chi-square tests, if you look and go back to your matrix menu, it actually populated matrix B for you with your expected counts. So that's kind of nice. I see that that 8.6 I actually calculated was right there. And then I can go ahead and just fill out the other ones um, off of my calculator here. So I'm sort of doing things out of order, but it saves you some effort. So these guys are all going to be 8.6 repeating in the top row. And these were all 11.3. Again, show work for at least one of your counts. So kind of went all over here. Let me bring it back in. I checked my hypotheses in blue, H-O-H-A. I need to check my conditions. And for said conditions, it does say in the problem, I hope, that people were randomly assigned their survey. Um, so I'm looking for those magical words, random. Yep, very first sentence right here. So it is random assignment, which is great. That was a really bad circle. Um, I'm going to say for my conditions, treatments were randomly assigned. Yet again, we're dealing with an experiment. We're not sampling from the population. Oops, assigned. We're not sampling from the population, so we don't need the 10% condition here. We're not sampling without replacements. And I will just say that all expected counts in the table to the left are greater than or equal to five. So we're ready to go and do our chi-square test. Now, we could calculate this test statistic by hand, which I already started to do. My next term would go 5 minus 8.6 repeating, pairing up top middle, squared over 8.6 repeating, et cetera. Or we can just use our calculator, which is probably what you're going to want to do. So you would not need to show this work if you opt for just the calculator here. Let me run my chi-square test again. So observed, and then I hit calculate here. My test statistic is going to be 6.65. My p-value is 0.036. So 6.65, and then my uh, p-value was about 0.036. 
Um, it's worth stating here, if I was doing this like four step AP test, don't do this. Don't show the work and then just use your calculator anyway. If you do that and you like messed up your work, it could cost you points. So what you're probably gonna wanna do is just go straight to giving the answer here. You name the test. It's a chi-square test for homogeneity. The calculator didn't say the homogeneity part. I'm adding that in. We got my test statistic. We got my p-value. And the degrees of freedom are going to be two, the calculator had told me. How did they get that? Well, I've got two options here. That's going to be one. You take categories minus one. You've got three options here. You subtract one. That's two. One times two is two degrees of freedom overall. So we did get a pretty low p-value here, not like crazy low, like last problem, but still lower than our alpha, which means we would probably end up, well, we would end up rejecting HO for this problem. So in terms of writing a conclusion, since our p-value is 0.036, which is less than our alpha of 0.05, we're gonna reject HO. There is convincing evidence of a difference in the distribution of candy choice for different versions of the survey. Now I have a few things I wanna say about that. Our p-value came back low, but you'll notice when we did our calculator this time, like when you do a goodness of fit test, it's actually really nice. The calculator will like give you those components or contributions that you can look at. It didn't do that here. So that is an unfortunate limitation of our calculator technology. We can't go back and look at like, oh, what piece was the most impressive? Why are the distributions different? That didn't come through for us here, unfortunately. We could do that by hand and maybe eyeball it and see what looks the most impressive. Um, they're all sort of close though. So it would be kind of hard to do that just off the cuff here. Um, the control group looks pretty similar to what was expected but the blue and the red are off by a little bit here. Um, it seems like a lot more people chose the candy of their survey color when they did this, just very, very briefly looking at that. If I wanted to get kind of nitty gritty on the follow-up analysis, I would need to actually calculate those values to be certain. They didn't ask us to do this. They just asked for a conclusion. Our conclusion is that there is a difference. I didn't go out on a limb and say, hey, the survey actually made people more likely to choose that color. I just gave my little conclusion in more general terms. So that's gonna be our four step right there. Oh no, now we are actually looking at individual components, which we don't have access to. So this would be like a little bit of a sad thing right here. I, for the purposes of this video, I'm not gonna be able to do that with you guys because I don't wanna make you guys watch me to actually type this in and stuff. So we would have to actually go and calculate all six of those pieces to know which one was making the largest contribution. I do, however, have a problem I want to do based on yesterday's problem. What's more likely to happen in the EP test, they would give you like a computer output and then have you analyze the contributions that way. Whenever you get computer output, just read through it. It should explain in there what everything is going on. So if you look at this problem here, the expected counts are below the observed counts. So for each of these, this is observed, this is expected, and the third one is actually gonna be your contributions. So we sort of did this problem, but stopped early on it last video. This is like an analysis. We did end up getting a chi-square value of 18 point something. So this is like what we got the last lesson. Um, but we can actually just look at these components rather than have to calculate all of them out ourselves, which is good. So you'll recall, we did see a difference in the distribution of what entree people chose depending on the music that was playing. So here we can actually do a follow-up analysis and look at which of these numbers are the biggest. The two largest contributions are going to be right here and then right here as well. 
So this would be a question of, okay, well, what do those numbers actually mean? And I'm gonna pause and come back with that so I can just tab over and show you guys what those numbers mean. All right, so when you look at our problem from last time, the two biggest components or contributions are gonna be middle, middle, and then middle rights in terms of our setup right here. If you look back at your notes from last time where we've got our little observed and expected tables right here, middle, middle corresponds to people who actually ordered Italian food while listening to French music. You can see one person did that. When we expected, if everything was the same, to see about 9.5 people. So there's quite a large difference there. The other biggest contribution was gonna be this guy right here, middle rights. Those are people who ordered the Italian entree when listening to the Italian music. So that ended up being quite a lot higher than we would have expected. So our two largest component contributions, one of them was we got way less than we thought we should. One of them is where we got way more. The overall largest of the options was the very middle one, being that way less people ordered the Italian entree when listening to French music than what we would have expected. So if I was gonna write a follow-up analysis about this, it appears that the Italian entree was the most susceptible to change based on the music that was playing. French music, yes, a lot more people chose French food. And actually, if you look at it here, just studying our numbers, the French entree, when there was French music playing right here, did go up. It went from like, oh, we expected 30, we got 39. But the biggest like difference or the biggest discrepancy was actually in the Italian entree. When French music was playing, only one person ordered Italian food. So actually that seems like maybe the French music turned people away from the Italian entree. And then when that Italian music was playing, we did get many more people who actually ordered it than expected. So putting that into words, I'll write something down on the side so you guys can have a good model, but that would be a good stopping point for this video. All right, so again, the idea here is that we're just looking at making a decision about some of the larger contributions in our problem. I picked the biggest two. Those are the most responsible for our reason to reject HO and for our reason to say there actually is a difference in the distribution of our variables. So you have to be cautious when you do this that you don't make too strong of a claim. We did, I think, have random assignment here Random assignment would allow us to say that perhaps it was the music that caused this to happen. But you also have to worry about like weird things too. Like maybe the French band was just really awesome and did a great job where the Italian musician was just terrible. Like there are lots of things going on right here, but the fact that there was random assignments means our group should have been about equal, which means that the difference that we're seeing um, can be assumed to be because of the music in some fashion. So that's how you would perform a little follow-up analysis. Remember, you only will do a follow-up analysis if you end up getting statistically significant results or if your p-value is low enough. If you end up failing to reject and you're like, well, I can't tell if there's a difference in the distribution, doing a follow-up analysis would be kind of silly because you don't have a one that's way different than all the others. So that's how you would set that up. In the next video, we're gonna learn about a very similar test called the chi-square test for independence.